we got a lot to catch up on in the Linux world this week. We're going to jump right into it by talking about KDE's annual report for 2023 has just dropped. And with that comes an earnings report, which is what I'm actually interested in. I'll post the link in the description below so you can view the entirety, including the community report. But buried towards the end of all of this is an actual breakdown of income and expenses, which is not looking great, even though the article above talks about an increase in supporting membership, record sponsorships, and rise in individual donations. Higher overall expenses driven by personnel and events have actually caused KD as an organization to go into the negative. A breakdown here on the left-hand side in euros is the income that they've earned over the year, which amounts to around $350,000, although they spent over $457,000 in expenses Again, this is in euros, giving us a net loss, which I don't see labeled here, in the magnitude of 107K. White, a discrepancy here. If we break that down as a percentage, that's around 30% more earnings that need to be made in order to actually to just run net positive, which is a huge undertaking. Considering the type of income that comes in, supporting members and donations are a majority. We can see that in the orange here. This makes up over 50% of the overall income. The expenses, though, is mainly staff and contractors that they have to issue in order to actually keep KD running and all the development running as well. Even though this isn't the best news, even though this isn't the best news, fundraising will continue and there is a new campaign and KDE feature that has been added into the KDE Plasma experience. We're going to talk about that inside Plasma's 6.2 software feature freeze, we get notable new features, including it's possible now to block apps from inhibiting sleep on the lock screen. Newly installed Plasma widgets are now shown at the top of the grid. You can easily prop and use user avatars in the system settings users page. Added support for seven day weather forecasts, including a chance for precipitation and much more. But what I'm actually interested in is a added yearly notification to ask for donations. That's right, asking for donations in Plasma is new. Why do we ask for donations so often? Because it's important as KDE becomes more successful increasing the number of people that use the software, their overall costs have grown. And they label all the different costs that have come with this. But now we will be seeing, well, at least if you're using KDE Plasma, this new donation dialog box prompting you currently once yearly on if you want to make a donation to KDE. Now, the idea here is just to get this in front of more eyeballs. We can imagine this is a controversial thing, but overall, it's actually been fairly received from the community side of things, at least from what I've been reading. People are actually fine with the fact that they're adding this into KDE Plasma. Let me know what you think about it in the comment section below. I'd love to hear, but I think people are so receptive because of the frequency that this happens. Asking once yearly and then going away for a whole entire year seems reasonable overall, and especially if you're using their desktop environment, it's nice to understand that they do have operating costs. Anyways, with that being said, we're going to move on to more in Rust development as we've had quite a wild week last week with some Rust drama in the Linux kernel. This week, we have some good news. Rust was receiving and getting a little bit of flack over the last few weeks, and about a year ago, we had our first official Rust written network driver specifically for the Phi hardware, which was introduced in kernel version 6.8. That also showed us how developers could code in Rust and actually be contributors to the Linux kernel. Well, this week we get even more progress as there has been a new Rust Phi network driver that's been added to the kernel. With only 100 lines of code, this driver supports Applied Microcircuits Corporation QT 2025 Phi driver based on a driver for Tahuti Networks TN4 zero XX chips. So regardless of your take on the C and Rust Linux divide, there are plenty of maintainers chugging along, adding Rust to the kernel, and we're starting to see it in very serious places. Because the integration of Rust into Linux has made significant improvements here, even though it sparked controversy and debate within the community on whether or not it's fragmenting the code, there's also huge benefits, including one, which is gaining more maintainers who can actually lead the next generation of development in the Linux kernel, it's going to become important as we grow to enhance security, safety, and maintainability. Otherwise, does Linux go by the wayside? Let me know what you think and smash that like button as we talk about Debian planning to remove unmaintained packages. This is a huge undertaking by Debian and its maintainers, but it's a big deal that they do it. There are over 74,000 packages available in Debian's repo for x86-64 systems, and a good number of them are not maintained anymore. So it's time to do a little bit of cleanup. So we at least have some serious discussion and talks and plans on how to approach these un 
maintain packages and what to actually do with them. And Scott Kitterman here made a valid point. I don't think we need more process. We just need someone to do the work of finding the packages and filing the bugs. I agree that some of this is crucial to ensure an automated process doesn't lead to unwanted removals. However, I don't see someone stepping in to remove bugs against other maintainers packages as long as we have strict ownership of packages. Many people are hesitant to touch a package even for fixing it. Asking for its removal might be even less well received. Therefore, if an automated procedure were to create release manager or management bugs, based on the defined criteria, it would help reduce some of the social pressure. AK, it's going to take a lot to go through these packages and figure out whether or not they're being maintained, how long they've been maintained for, and they don't want to just put it into the work of one person. Instead, they want to find an automated process with one person seemingly looking over that automated process, which makes a lot of sense because if there's 74,000 packages that they have to go through and figure out which ones are maintained, which ones aren't, which ones have critical bugs that need to be removed or at least become stale, you can understand how that is a massive undertaking and why there is such a push for aggressive package removal. They're really trying to get rid of outdated, user-maintained packages that have little or no use. There's gonna be a huge balancing act between automation and this manual oversight that they're planning on doing, but I know that Debian will be able to do it. Either way, they're gonna require community collaboration, and they do talk about getting more involvement from the community in order to keep the community engaged and help them actually see this to fruition. This conversation really shows us how fundamental issues come up from just maintaining software quality, collaborating, and keeping a community engaged. It's not only a problem for Debian, although they are seemingly trying to fix this issue, but at least fellow developers are now talking about this. Please allow me to open a can of worms, package removal from unstable, deciding when it is time to remove a package from unstable is difficult. There are many users still, and it is unclear whether they're keeping the package imposes at cost. In this mail, I want to argue for a more aggressive package removal and see consensus on a way forward, including a way to query through a database and trying to see whether or not they can get a queried set of source packages that are not maintained anymore. Anyways, we'll continue to follow how this development comes through as it does affect a lot of the packages we currently have access to, but I want to move on to another conversation and seeming mistake as the JPEG XL reversal may be happening from Google. For those of you unfamiliar, Google decided to deprecate and remove the JPEG XL encoder from Chromium and their Chromium-based browser, Google Chrome. Here's a commit that removed it all and added a note about the upcoming JPEG XL removal on version 110. This was November 9th of 2022. Now it wasn't exactly removed that time, but shortly after it started deprecating itself. And now there's conversation to bring back JPEG XL. And this conversation here is really sparked by none other than Apple announcing JPEG XL support in their Safari browser. Isn't that interesting? As now Google may have prematurely removed it, especially after Apple chooses to keep it updated and support it. And we can see this in the Safari 17 release notes as they continue adding support for JPEG XL inside the images new features category. So that's kind of a mixed signal. And then would you know it, Firefox is also considering a Rust implementation of JPEG XL now. So that's two big browsers, really the next two biggest ones behind Google Chrome that are planning on continuing support and even creating new support for JPEG XL encoding in images. But that's not the funniest part. Ironically, Google might actually help develop that support, but this time it's going to be Rust-based. In this post, it says productive conversations with the JPEG XL team at Google Research around the future of format in Firefox, which is wild as Google has agreed to apply their subject matter expertise to build a safe, performant, compact, and compatible JPEG XL decoder in Rust and integrate this decoder into Firefox, which is interesting because even though that they're promoting this, this new image format and encoder, just over a year ago, they were trying to deprecate it in their own browser. I'm not sure what kind of goodwill and contribution open source projects like this, especially since they are competition, but maybe this will help advance the open web and foster a little bit of innovation across browsers and not just have it focused on one like Chromium based browsers, but not sure what the change of heart here is besides the fact that they need to remain competitive against the other browsers. And maybe Google gets a little bit of help developing with Firefox and having developers and maintainers on the Mozilla side actually help build and maintain something that they didn't even care about in the first place. I did make a video about all of this a year ago where I talk about the deprecation of JPEG XL in Google Chrome and why that was a bad decision. I'll post a link in the description below so you can check that video out. But regardless, let's get on to some of the hardware and software survey results 
in Steam for August 2024. The reason I'm going through these results is I want to talk about very specific Linux only information. And that's because we've officially dropped below 2% when it comes to the Linux platform, at least for gaming, according to this Steam survey. So if we look at the combined, so if we look at the combined most popular versions of operating systems, we are now at 1.92, a drop that's been happening over the last few months, as it seems people are just gaming less. A huge boost was given to us because of the Steam Deck that was released a few years ago. This really helped the numbers go up and break through the threshold of the 2% but now we're back down. Well, that's because the hardware is getting older and there are different options out there to play. But anyways, Linux remains strong, even in gaming, and it completely dominates the server space. It's just something interesting to see and catch up on. Nothing really big to take away from this other than that Steam OS Hollow is the most used operating system simply because that's what most people use on the Steam Deck. And this is the Steam gaming platform results. I'm always interested in seeing what type of hardware people are using. So on their Linux systems, a majority of people are running 16 gigs of memory. They're using an AMD processor. There are four core processors. Graphics cards include AMD typically with over 27% using some sort of AMD graphics, which is quite wild. The virtual RAM on the system is one gig and their primary display resolution is 1920 by 1080 still. Free hard drive space is somewhere between 10 to 100 gigs and the total drive space is somewhere between 250 and 500 gigs. Again, it's always cool to see what type of hardware. And if you wanna check out a more in-depth description of operating system statistics when it comes to gaming, you can definitely check it out at, at the Steam Surveys monthly survey results. I'll post a link in the description below for this one as well. Lots of cool things happening in Linux this week. Things have settled down a little bit with all the drama from last week, but either way, I'll keep you informed. So make sure to subscribe below and hit that like button if you haven't already. Catch me in a great community on Discord and I'll catch you in another video. Thanks for watching. Linux can be hard to understand, but I take the most commonly used terms, commands, and subjects in Linux and I break them down into simple to read documents, including Linux terms, flashcards, a checklist, a cheat sheet, and a mind map. And if you're ready to level up your Linux experience and knowledge, go to learn.savvynick.com now and get access to these sheets.